So we'll go ahead and open this as a regular meeting room. So we all join. Excuse me. Can I, before we open the room, can I can I say something in response to building my leadership review? I feel like I, if I don't say it, I'd be violating my leadership review. Can, can you say that when we're in the meeting? Yeah, that actually, if, if it went that far, I believe it would be too late. Uh, it, it's very important. And I, I mean, I'll be as nice as possible about it. Um, um, I think there is, I think there's something to be concerned about here that we are uh, talking about this interview and that we're going to deliberate about the material in this board packet in the open session. Now, uh, did I lawyer leave? Yes, you need me to go. I yeah, can you go? Uh, this, as I understand it, people have already submitted public records requests for this material. Um, and and I'm, I'm saying this out of protection of, of the candidates um, because I feel like they should be afforded, well, and I think they do have uh, an expectation of a reasonable amount of privacy or at least uh, full disclosure about the process. And um, but by talking about this material in an open session, uh, I feel uh, where we're going to deliberate about the contents. And if we're going to deliberate, deliberate about the contents, it's going to constitute, it's going to mean that it's an open meeting and that we're going to have to release the material. And there's uh, the presidential search, uh, feedback and input comments uh, from the presidential search committee. And uh, well, applicant resume and cover letter, and, and among other things. And uh, and it's already uh, been denied. And I understand it that this material for public employees, case law has it to where this material is not uh, releasable to the public upon this normal request. But but we're going into uncharted territory to where uh, we're going into in. This material now is considered to be part of an open session, an open meeting, and and I feel that we won't be able to uh, shield it uh, under the same statutes. And uh, and, and as I understand it, the candidates themselves, uh, I don't don't and believe any of them have signed disclosures uh, allowing us to release the information and. Um, yeah, so what, what, what else? Um, I, I believe that there's a pretty good potential that this material will have to be disclosed. Um, and and right, right now it's protected. And the reason why executive session is there is to protect this information. And so we're not going about this process properly. So, can, I, can I answer? Sure. I asked the president to ask each of the candidate, each of the trustees, if they would be willing to vote for an executive session. We need to have four votes. I could not get, we could not get four people to vote for an executive session. That is why this is an open session. So, are, are you admitting that? This deliberation should be done in executive session. Then? No, the option for executive session was presented to each trustee, and two trustees did not respond that they wanted to have it in a closed session. Therefore, it had to be an open session because we do not have four trustees willing to vote people into executive session board, and you were one of them. So you're saying that. The process and laws then don't matter because we're including this material in an open session meeting. Next. I think that's a legal question for our council, and it's a shame you didn't ask him beforehand rather than an open session. We brought this candidate here for an interview, and I'm hoping we can go right ahead and do that right now. Well, I, as a fiduciary, I believe we're exposing the college to. Um, we're just exposing the college to things that we don't need to if we did the process properly. Your concerns have been listened to. Okay. 
I'd like to open the meeting then by the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, okay. I just, just for your awareness, um, our legal counsel is on its way back. It's so, and just just for your awareness, Chair. And I have copies of our packet. What packet would mean is pretty good. Trustee so McKinsey has some concerns, legal concerns. I'd like to repeat them now for legal counsel. Yes. And could you do it in five minutes so we can go ahead and 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 get the interview started? So we're having an open session meeting right now. And as I understand it, uh, this material is protected uh, from being released and disclosed. Uh, is that true? Yes. What, what material are we talking about? The open session meeting packet that's been provided to you. I have not seen it. You have not seen it. It's the resume, it's the uh, president, uh, president committee, uh, presidential search committee uh, feedback and comments about each individual candidate and their thoughts on and weeks and strengths. Um, it's also um, it's called their cover letter. I believe I saw that in there. So uh, the information that is not available public would be the information that has not that the candidates have not con consented to the notes of the of the uh, of the uh, committee that, that go to the ap applicant uh, those sorts of things are available for the trustees they in my understanding they have not been released to the public and will not be released to the public so right now this this uh we're interviewing candidates, applicants for positions, their personal information other than what has been released by consent, uh, which are which are abbreviated bios. Uh, this information is not public information right now, but it is uh, available for the trustees who will be making their decisions. So under the Open Meeting Act, and not the Open Meeting Act, the Public Records Act, this is not uh, a public record at this point. And it probably will not be never be a public record. So if we're gonna deliberate in an open meeting, because our board packets then are open to the public. This information on candidates, the purpose of this meeting is to interview candidates. That's what we're going to be doing for the next number of days. So that information is is available for trustees. It is not public record. So you can review it, you can ask questions, you can deliberate um, on it, but the records themselves are not public records. So thank you for admitting that they're, they're not public records. So by including them in an open session and deliberating on this packet materials, we're going to be asking follow-up questions specific to these contents and in context of the material. Um, then, so we will be deliberating about this content in an open meeting. It seems to me that because of that, uh, because we're deliberating about it, uh, that the information then should be disclosed to the public because it is an open meeting. And I find problem with that because, as you just said, this information is disclosable only to trustees, and uh, which is the point of executive session is that we're able to have these deliberations and able to be presented this material and uh, in executive session and be able to still provide these candidates uh, their expectation of privacy and, and to protect them. I mean, I mean, 
So we. Um, I think you're conflating the, the, the issue, the question of, of inquiring and interviewing the candidate and asking questions in public, which is done. It's not unusual. Um, sometimes it's, it's, this is done in executive session. Sometimes it's done publicly, but, but that is not unusual. You're conflating that with the Public Records Act. So you can you can do your deliberations. You can inquire of the uh, of the candidates, ask questions, ask follow up questions. That can all take place in public. Uh, these candidates are here and have applied for a public office. Uh, Look for you, but their records here are not public records by law. Absolutely, they are not public records by law. And if you look at the one resume that was uh, requested of, and there was actually a lawsuit for it, uh, to where basically there was a public records request for that um, and public employee's application and resume package, and it was denied. But we're in new territory now because that public resume, application and resume now, and all the material is now going to be deliberated and included in an open meeting. So it is we're in uncharted territory, and I feel like we are gravely exposing the college. Greg, are you feeling that we should go into executive session then immediately? Yes. Would you vote yes? Let's take the vote. Legal counsel, or would that be a uh... Okay. No, we do not have executive session on the agenda. So, but I will tell you as legal counsel, the, 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 there are two separate questions here. One is public records, and the records do not get released to the public. The other question is to interview a candidate based on materials that the, that the board members have, and to do follow-up questions, that is, that is, in my view, perfectly legal. We are walking on thin ice, having our deliberations based off the material that is not exposable to the public. We, we are interviewing, not deliberating. We are basing our questions and conversations off the of material and before us, included in our board packet. We are allowed follow-up questions. We are allowed conversation. If you are steering my conversation in an open meeting, that is what executive session is for. Okay. As legal counsel, I, I think you, you are not correct on this. Mm -hmm. We can keep the records non-public, and, and the board can still do the interviews. We can provide the material in an open meeting, is what you're saying. This, this, this information, the documents, are for trustees only. In an open meeting. Well, you're not handing them out. I actually, I have them available. If, uh, yeah, and this one right here. So, are you denying this? This is this is the same copy that's in there. Are you saying that I cannot hand this to the public? Yes, it is not a public record. And if you if you are following your fiduciary duty as a trustee, that's uh, why I'm having this conversation. A con con confidential uh, document. So we are. It is. It is not a public record. We are allowed to be able to base questions and conversation off of material that we cannot give out to the public. That is correct. In open session. That is correct. You, you, this board is the board that will hire the next president of this institution. Yes, and it should be done in executive session is what I'm saying, to protect the candidate. It, it does not have to be done in executive session. According to you, which is guidance, and, and I'm telling you, that I've talked to other people and, and they are blown away at that suggestion. Well, because this material, because it's associated with an open meetings, it, it, we are in uncharted territory. It is, it is not uncharted territory. If you look at the established case law, law, if you go to the public records law, if you go to the attorney general's manual, I was just there, I think it's page 12 or 13. They talk about uh, the two instances. If we're public officials, like uh, three appointed officials, actually. Your resumes, because you're an elected official, uh, must be released. If you're a public employee person, then uh, that, that case law has basically uh, precedence that said that they, that was denied. 
but that was never included in an open meeting before. So this is the point of going into executive session to protect candidates. That's why, and, and to protect the college, to protect everyone involved, to have honest, straight deliberation instead of talking around things. Now, the fact that trustees get information to do interviews, to make decisions, uh, some of the information that you get as trustees is not public record. Okay, and that's, that would be true in this case. But that does not mean that you cannot have a discussion in an open meeting. The Open Meeting Act and the public records law are two separate sets of statutes. So you don't need to conflate them. The fact that you consider documents that might not be public record and, and have discussions uh, on a subject in an open meeting is not the same thing. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that what you looked at is a public record. These are not public records. They are for the board members to educate themselves on the candidates and uh, the interview and continue. I, I feel like we're waiving by including material in an open meeting. I feel like we're waiving the protection provided by statutes and the public may come in and request it after the meeting. Well, public makes requests all the time. But I feel like we're waiving the protection for the reason that we denied it before this meeting. According to, I think it's 74-106 is the reason that we denied it before, but since it's now a part of an open meeting, I feel like we cannot do that. We can. The, this information is for the board members. It is for your, you as a board member, as a trustee, to consider and educate yourself prior to conducting interviews. It is your resource, and it is only your resource. To educate yourself on candidates before conducting and we have not been provided in executive session well it doesn't matter you have it available to you for an open meeting and you're gonna use the interviews you know yes you can do this and I, I, council you've heard council before you but i'm i, I had to speak up as a fiduciary and, and reduce trying to do the best for this college that I feel like we're still making a great mistake. Are we going to vote for executive session? I don't think we can if we don't have it on the agenda, can we? Well, here's what we could do. Um, if you want it on the executive session, you can make a motion, somebody can make a motion to amend the agenda. We're in the middle of the meeting, so we have we've got to articulate the reason why I couldn't get on there earlier. And it was, if we can articulate a good, good thing, reason it was not on executive session, uh, it wasn't on the agenda earlier, then we take a vote to amend the agenda first. And then if we have executive session here, this would be an executive session under um, a, uh, I'll come up with that, but if you want to amend the agenda, you have to articulate good faith reason. Good faith reason for this would be that it was it was unknown that this objection would be made until the middle of this meeting. Um, Trustee uh, Mackenzie, will you vote to go into executive session? Let's take the roll call vote. No, we have a motion. No, no. We have to open the meeting. Yes. If we get on the agenda and we have any, uh, the potential for executive session. Will you support it? I'll say this. I don't recall any conversation where I talked about an executive session for this meeting. Dr. Sabali supposedly called you and shared with you. Well, then there was a miscommunication. That's why it's an open session. I wasn't getting a step positive from you or from the time. Well, then I'm saying that I believe that there is a miscommunication. And I don't understand then how five trustees can report in one before. Let's go ahead and do the process here, but let's go ahead and open the meeting first. We haven't done that. So I'd like to open the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you all join me, please? I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There's a quorum present. 
So the meeting is officially open. I would accept a motion for an executive session under the first we have a motion to amend the agenda to include an executive session uh, for the purpose of I mean, evaluating a candidate for uh, public governance. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Make that motion. So moved. Second. Second. Move okay. second. What, what would be the good faith, good faith reason that needs to be articulated in that motion? Would be that the understanding of, of uh, both legal counsel and the president of this institution and the chairman of this inst of the board of this institution is that two of the members would not vote for executive session, and for that reason, uh, this meeting was originally scheduled uh, for an, uh, an open discussion here, and now that you have made the motion to amend the agenda uh, that was something that was unknown to the other board members to legal counsel and certainly to the president of this institution because i also spoke with him so that would be our good faith reason mm -hmm. to go into executive session so moving second is there any further discussion mr chairman yes john mr chairman does that mean that every candidate interview will be an executive session I would hope so, that we can do consistently the same thing. If, if uh, Trustee uh, McKenzie will continue to agree, I would see no reason why we cannot do that. We can actually do that for the agendas for the next uh, interviews. We can put that on the agenda as an option and, and then have to vote at that time. I would change the agendas, yeah. And Mr. Chairman, one more follow up, if I could. Yes, sir. <clears throat> It was my understanding that we had a set of questions that we were going to ask each candidate and we were going to listen to their answers. I was not aware of any deliberation on the agenda or any intent for deliberation of, on an individual candidate. Am I, am I correct in that? Yes, I think you're correct. So uh, this is Angela, I'll pipe up here at this point. So the point of this hour and a half is to interview the candidate, deliberations will be done on all final candidates on the, I believe it's the 22nd of June uh, in, in hopefully executive session. Correct. So deliberation should not take place tonight. Interviewing only should take place tonight. Right. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say goodbye by saying aye. Yes, sir. roll call vote. Is it roll call to vote? amend the agenda? We're voting on amending the agenda. Oh, amend the agenda. I'm sorry, you're right. Correct. All in favor say aye. 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 Nay. Opposed, nay. Nay. Yeah, you're nay. 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 Okay. The motion passed three to one. Now we need a motion to go into executive session. Motion to go into executive session under 74.
Well, I usually do something where if you look up on the video, I can change the music session. So the motion would, would be to go under executive session for some title code 74 206 a um, to uh, pursue uh, interview of uh, candidate public office for public employee. So somebody needs to say I can't move. So move. So move. Moved and seconded to go into executive session. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I trust the, the advice of our legal counsel. I don't think this is necessary and it's an abuse of transparency. I am not going to vote in favor of it. Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, if we, if we can take the vote, but if we, unless we have four votes, we're going to be in open session. John, unless we have four votes, we cannot go into executive session. Mr. Chairman, that's what I would prefer. Go ahead with the roll call. Mr. McKenzie? Yeah, let's go for him first, because there's no point in doing the rest of us. Well, let's go for him first. Wines? You have a vote? Let's go for him first, because there's no point in the rest of us doing it. Do we want to get this meeting moved on or not? I think you don't. Okay, I'll, do it. I'll start with the chairman, Trustee Wolf, or Chairman Wolf. Yes. Uh, Brochet. Yes. Trustee Geddes. No. Trustee McKenzie. Yes. The motion fails, so we will continue in open session. Dr. Brand, my apology for this difficulty here getting started. We'll be happy to extend your time <laughs> if you're still able to. Yes, sir. Chair Wold, are you ready for me to get us started? Yes, I am. Okay. Dr. Brand, I hope you have had a wonderful day at the college and have enjoyed your open forums. Yes, ma'am. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. So uh, again, thank you for your patience as we as we get through a few of these details here to, to get this started. Um, have you had a chance to be introduced to all of the trustees? I know Trustee Getty is here on um, the Zoom call, so you probably haven't had a chance to meet him yet. Right. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll follow along with that then, Chair Wold, here in just a minute. I just want to remind the trustees that you absolutely are, um, may ask follow-up questions. I just ask that you keep those follow-up questions related to Dr. Brand's experience, um, uh, knowledge, ability to do the job at NIC. So it needs to be strictly professional related, uh, career related. And then in order to keep um, everything consistent or as consistent as we can, Chair Wold is going to ask all of the questions of uh, all of the candidates, since we know that Chair Wold will be at all of the interviews in person. So we will have him ask those questions. And um, Chair Wold, I will turn it over to you to have the trustees introduce themselves and then for you to get started with questions. I'm here, my video, my Wi-Fi is terrible, so I'm not turning on my video, um, but I'm here if anyone needs anything at all. Thank you, Angela. Yep, thank you. You met, you met me, yes, never met you. Yeah. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Greg McKenzie. 
Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Been on the board for about two years. Everyone else here was appointed. I was elected. And um, great meeting. Yeah. I heard you at the, um, well, actually, both of them are earlier sessions. Okay. Okay. Um, and Angela, I did make a change. I, I did assign questions to the various trustees. Oh, and, okay. And if a trustee is not here or cannot do his question, I'll do his question for you. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Before the first question. Yes. Uh, I would just like for the public to, to realize uh, where do these questions come from? <clears throat> so thank you for the question. I uh, wrote those questions based on the position profile that we developed. And then I gave the two trustees who were the representatives on the search committee uh, a chance to edit them. Um, that would have been trustee Brochet and trustee uh, Banducci. Uh, Brochet, I heard from that he had no changes. Banducci, I heard, uh, I did not have a response from him. All right, so just for the record, no other trustees were queried on what questions that only Chair Wold was planning to ask today. And the plan was to have no other trustees be able to ask questions. Is that true? That is correct. I was trying to stick with consistency because I knew Chair Wold would be there in person for all five final candidates. Mm -hmm. I was just more also trying to point out that I was never queried on what questions to ask. For the Trustee, McKin Trustee McKenzie, you are absolutely, um, uh, it is perfectly fine for you to ask follow-up questions and to keep this, this process somewhat informal. So if you have questions that you would like to ask of Dr. Brand, that's why you're there, is to learn more about the candidates and to, to ask those follow-ups. So please... Please feel free to do so. Well, Dr. Brand, I'm going to get this started. You've got a list of questions in front of you also. Yes, sir. And I'm going to go ahead and read the first question. Understanding the mission and vision of North Idaho College, walk us through what you believe are the most important elements of being a visionary president at NIC. Describe how your leadership style and approach will support a climate of engagement, accountability, and healing. Well, I first I want to say thank you to everyone for being here today and for this opportunity. It's, it's an honor for me to be here. Um, in, in looking at the concept of mission and vision, um, I think there's, there's both a, a big picture and a small picture approach. Um, one of the things that I told the committee in the, the Zoom interviews is I'm, I'm a little bit different in how I view the community college mission. Um, I was at the American Association of Community Colleges uh, Future Presidents Institute back in October. And I was listening to Walter Bumper speak, and he was talking about the different eras that community colleges have really gone through as they've matured in this country and how through maybe the, the 50s and the 60s, right after World War II, when we had the enrollment boom, that access was, was the pillar of, of community colleges. And then around 2007, we saw the emphasis move towards student success, and that was a, a byproduct of, of a new presidential administration. And so we began to key on things like retention and, and uh, enrollments and graduation rates and, and really things that we hadn't thought about as far as, as far as being a part of the mission of the college. And, and now we've moved into the era where it's about equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the way I see it is a little bit different. I really see not, not really three different phases, but I see those as the three access points of the mission of a community college in the 21st century. I think that we still focus on access, we focus on success, we focus on equity. If we do those three things well, then, then I think that's really what a community college needs to do to thrive. Now, the part of the, the question about being a visionary president, boy, there's a loaded question. Um, uh, and I don't know exactly how I would respond to that other than to talk about my own uh, experiences and, and where I've been. I, I will key on the part of the question that talks about uh, accountability and healing probably more than anything else. When I came into my position currently at ACTC, uh, we were in a similar situation. We had a we had some issues that we had to work through. There was low faculty morale, and there was a there was several things that happened to, to to make this to make this occur. And one was the college had gone through significant layoffs before I got there, um, and that was a result of declining enrollments and some other things. The Kentucky budget was down, so there there were a lot of faculty who who had been laid off. 
they went through a period over the next several years of kind of a revolving door of, of CAOs. They had three CAOs in two years. And so there was a lot of unrest. There was mistrust um, among the faculty. And then they brought in a brand new president. So when Dr. Ferguson, when I came into my role, he said, you know, one of the, the things that I was mandated to do was try to bring a calming influence and, and some, some healing to that, to, to that aspect. And so what we did were, were several things. Um, one of the biggest ones was we decided to really focus on institutional culture as, as something that, that would be a part of what the mission of the college was, was going to be internally. And so we created a new institutional committee to go with all of our other ones. And we created a culture committee. And their sole focus was doing things to improve morale, the culture of the institution, to really make it feel like a place where people wanted to work again. Um, now, a lot of those, you know, efforts kind of got curtailed because we turned around and hit the pandemic, but it, but it was a good start. We took the pay survey. Um, we looked at where our weaknesses were. Um, some of those were in, in the areas of supervision between people, and you can expect that, you know, if you've got that kind of, of unrest. And so the other thing that we decided to, get, to do together, me and Dr. Ferguson, is he had an idea to create an operating system, if you will, something to rally around for the college so that we can speak a common language. And, and everybody in higher ed has, has gone into the improvement business, the quality business. We've seen declining enrollments for years across America. It's a ubiquitous problem. And so with that has come this emphasis in quality. And so we were both very interested in a product that you may or may not be familiar with. It's um, done by the Covey Group and it's called 40X. It stands for the Four Disciplines of Execution. And it's an operating system that you can use to create a culture of continuous improvement because that's that was the second part of my mandate was not only to improve the culture but to create a culture of continuous improvement because you not only need that from an institutional effectiveness standpoint with accreditors but you know whether we want to admit it or not higher education is a business and so we, we've got to in some ways treat it like one we've got to make those quality improvements to make sure that we're providing the best service to our to our students that we possibly can and so as a coach, because that's what my background is in, is coaching, 40X made sense to me intuitively because what it is, is it's a system that focuses on the execution of the strategy. Um, most of my experience in higher ed has always shown me that people are pretty good at planning, and we do an inordinate amount of planning in higher ed. We do a lot of evaluating as well. But it's the implementation of the strategy that sometimes I think hangs us up on major initiatives and improvements that we want to make. And I've told both forums today that probably Everyone can remember a time in their career where there's been some initiative that's, that's people have talked about, people are on board and they're fired up and they're excited and they leave thinking this is gonna be great, we're gonna do this great thing. And six months later, you look at the person down the hall from you and say, oh, uh, you remember that thing we were gonna do? Are we still doing that? You know, that type of thing. And so we really wanted to do something significant. So the 40X system, makes you set aside part of your time in your work week. Um, they, they call it the whirlwind. It's a concept that you start with, where uh, most of the things that we do on a daily basis in any organization are the day-to-day -day activities that are required to keep the business, the organization functioning. We tend to get caught up in that. And because of that, it's hard to focus on improvements. It's hard to get better. It's hard to see where the gaps are. So 40X makes you take 20% of your time out of your week and focus on whatever it is that you feel is important to move the needle forward. Because that's what we really wanted to do was find something where we could simultaneously move the needle forward, also give people a common thing to rally around so that hopefully that workplace culture would improve. And, and it's really paid some big dividends. And I, I can tell you very quickly what those what those principles are. Principle one is focus on the wildly important. So as an institution, we got together um, and we had a consultant from Covey that trained us on how to use the system. We spent a lot of time and invested a lot of, of money and, and resources into this. But we wanted to create what were called our wildly important goals for the institution. And so after meeting for weeks and discussing this, we came up with a couple of wigs. That's what they're called, wigs, wildly important goals. And so we set those and we put a two year clock on it, which, which is a long time, but we had some pretty ambitious goals. One is we wanted to increase the graduation rate at the institution. And we had a we had a pretty ambitious goal. We wanted to raise it significantly. And then secondly, we wanted to increase our transfer rate. We had some wigs under that, and these were goals that supported those goals. One of them involved uh, the SESI surveys, survey of student engagement. We wanted to increase our retention rate. And we also wanted to increase enrollment. So those were some pretty lofty goals that we set. And we had metrics attached to every one of those. So that was the beginning. 
But here's where the neat part comes in. You take everybody in the organization and you put them in teams. And so each team um, that works together at the college, and however you assemble those, we did ours in academics, for example, by academic disciplines and subgroups. For example, nursing had their own team, the humanities had their own team, scientists had their own team, et cetera. What they would do was create their own wigs, their own wildly important goals for their area. And the only rule was, as long as it supported one of these other goals, then that was what we were looking for. And so we we put this system in place. It's taken about three years, and the results have been phenomenal. Step two is you have to um, you have to act on the lead measures. We have what are called lead measures and lag measures. And I can explain that to you very quickly. If a person says that's a goal if they want to lose weight, um, you would set a goal for that. I want to lose 15 pounds. Let's say you set it on New Year's. I want to lose 15 pounds by June 1st, 2023. Well, you set a 40X goal from X to Y by when? Well, that's a lag measure because you're not going to measure that until July. So then you look at your lead measure. What are the things I can do on a regular basis that might make this occur? And so exercise, reduction in calories, those types of things. So that's kind of how the system works. The third aspect of it is, is you keep a compelling scoreboard. So what 40X does is, is it makes it almost competitive on these teams because it does focus around the concept of teams. And so you keep a scoreboard and you track weekly what your progress is in moving towards this goal. And then the final one is, is you create a cadence of accountability. What that does is ensures that you meet every week, no matter what's going on at the institution, no matter what your schedule is, you have to adhere to that once a week meeting that you have with your team. Sometimes we would do them virtually on teams. Sometimes we would do them in person. But even through the pandemic, we kept 40X going. There were some other schools in the state that were doing it. They paused theirs and we did not because we felt like it was that important that we make the progress. So we're coming up now on the time where it's, it's time to look at these, at these metrics and where we are, and, and we've just been blown away. We found that with um, our, two, our two main wigs, we reached one, the other one we didn't. I'll tell you about the one we didn't. That was our transfer rate. We came up a little short. We figured out why though. For some reason in KCTCS on the transfer rate, they include AAS students in the transfer rate. Now, we can't figure out why. It makes absolutely no sense because AAS students typically don't transfer. I'm sorry? I like it. Oh, okay. Because AA students typically don't transfer, so we couldn't figure out why they were included. Well, they've since changed that at CPE, the Council for Post-Secondary Education. They're no longer going to, to keep track of those. So we're fixing to see our transfer rates go through the roof probably in the next cycle when it's measured. But our graduation rate soared. Our graduation rate for our 2019 cohort surpassed our expectations. We're at 43 percent, which which I'm very, very proud of because that's an extremely good graduation rate. And looking at our, our metrics that were under those, um, when we looked at our enrollment, our enrollment went up even during the pandemic significantly. We moved the needle there. We moved the needle on our SESI scores. Those scores went up. We met our benchmarks on that. And on retention, I was also very proud there. Our fall to fall retention rate went all the way up to 62 percent. So it was proof that the system works. And we saw all this progress in the teams that were supporting these groups as well. I can tell you story after story of a team who came up with an improvement they could make and they made it. And what it did was it gave people more ownership of the things that they were doing and it gave them something to be proud of. And so from that first inception of when we started doing these wigs and these wigs for the academic teams will last for a semester um, and for most groups they last that long. We would we would award things for teams that met their benchmarks. And so at the end of the first year, we had this huge celebration based around the idea of 40X. So it was really it was really a neat thing to see the campus come together at our professional development day to see people excited about the work that they were doing and to see the enthusiasm. And had we approached this in any other way and we talked about any type of program of total quality improvement at a time when employee morale was already down, I don't think it would have worked. But because we tapped into people's competitive nature, we tapped into people's ability to want to achieve more, and, and we really tried to be inspiring in how we did this, um, I, I think it really worked. And it captured those things that you're talking about. It, it helped with the healing aspect. It helped with accountability. The other thing that really helped with healing is, is when I came in, I decided that there's not going to be anything at all autocratic or dogmatic about my style. There's not really any way. But I went out of my way to make sure that I let everybody know that your voice matters, that we are going to do things together. We're going to walk the path together. I told the faculty, I'm not going to come in making demands and, and dictating things and telling you we've got to change this. And we've got to change that. 
you know, I, I knew early on that, I, for example, I wanted to reorganize academic affairs, but I wasn't there to do that in the first year to year and a half of being there because they just weren't, they weren't ready for that. So they needed time more than anything else. And the trust had to be rebuilt. I think one of the ways that I rebuilt trust with the faculty was um, one of the things I was tasked with coming in was I had to write a faculty load and overload policy. Um, they didn't really, they didn't really have one that, that covered everything. And, and a lot of institutions who are like ours who had merged a technical college with a community college, they realized there was inequity in the pay structure for technical faculty and gen ed faculty. So we had to tackle that. So we spent a long time, about a year and a half, writing that policy, and the faculty was very involved in that. We would take iterations of that policy to them and say, what do you think? We put faculty in small groups. We talked to them about it. We tried to figure out how we can be fair, how we can be equitable. We can't break the bank, so, you know, we can't pay everybody a million dollars, but we do want to be fair and, and pay people for the work that they're doing. And what came out of that, I think, was a pretty good document that, that we use, and it's actually a model for KCTCS institutions to use today. So I'm very proud of that. Um, so I think that just having a collaborative approach, which I have naturally a coaching style, is, um, is, is the way that I think would be a good start here. Frank, do you want to take question number two? So we follow up questions during each one? Sure. Do you have any right now that you like? Yeah, two came to mind. Okay. Um, I'm glad you talked about culture and it seems, um, yeah, yeah I, I liked what I heard. Uh, this college, I will also say, has major cultural improvements needed. And um, if, I'd say if you don't give the influential bodies what they want, then you will, will be in their target areas. Um, so I'm, I'm in possession of an email from constituent group leaders, nonetheless, around the college policies to obstruct leadership. Um, they're complaining about a policy, but then not even following that policy suggestion or reporting, and instead complain directly to the accreditation agency. So I quote, I think we cannot have it both ways. When we say they're violating policy, but then not use the policy suggestions for reporting, end quote, that's an email. So how would you, my question for you is, how would you handle uh, subversive constituent groups and another question, how do you do step-by-step -step change this goal? Well, I think it's important to, if you've got a, as you term it, a subversive group, you know, I would, I would obviously want to talk to them and find out what the motivations are, find out, you know, what it is that's going on with the institution that's bothering them so much. But I think that's where transparency is an absolute key and a must. Um, and that's where that's where the trust issue is going to come in. I'm, I'm sure whoever comes in, there may be trust issues with the new president. And the only thing that's going to heal that is time, uh, I'm afraid. Um, you know, I would be committed to following the policies and procedures that are in the, the college's policies manual that are established by the board. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those five book people. I follow things by the book. Um, as far as that particular situation, I, I honestly don't know enough about the particular to speak to. I would like to hear from you that you would hold people accountable when they, well, do, when they don't. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they don't follow even their own policies and they're coordinating around. That's one of the things I like about the 40X system, and it's why we put it in. It's because we wanted accountability for everyone. And I think that but that's got to I think that's got to be built, though, as a cult, as a culture. You know, I don't think you can just come in and, and arbitrarily say we're all of a sudden going to hold everybody's feet to the fire. I think I think that that's that's got to be a process. I agree. Is it? You can't arbitrarily apply policies, and I feel like that's the problem with this institution. If you look at prior leadership for the past five years, is they've selectively um, chosen to apply policy. So, uh, next question. Any other follow-up questions? How would you reestablish a positive public image with our community and business partners to continue and evolve our efforts to best prepare and sustain the regional's workforce? Well, I think the president's got to be the public face of the institution. Absolutely. Um, I would look for every opportunity I could to speak to every group I could in town, whether it was the Rotary Club or, or anyone else, and tell the story of the college about what we're doing, what our value is, what our programs are, because I, I think that, that that's paramount to the image of an institution. I would absolutely make good use of the marketing and communication division of the college because that's what that's what they're here for. Um, and, I, and I think a good president is, is going to do that. And I would talk about the things that I've talked to you about before. So if, um, if we implemented a system like the one that we're talking about, I would be in the community every day talking about that. 
But I think the other conversations that have to be had are with the employers. You know, we need to know what it is that they're looking for. One of the things that we did at ACTC when, when I got there was we have program advisory boards for all of our academic programs, but they really weren't meeting like, like they should. You know, we, we wanted them to be meeting twice a year with their advisory boards, which are made up of employers in the region that support those programs. And so we revamped that system. We got a committee together, me and the Dean of Institutional Effectiveness headed that. Um, and we made sure that all the program advisory boards were up to date. And then I attended those meetings with them and we met with everyone. And, and some of the results, you know, some of the things that they said, you know, were, were pretty harsh. I'll be honest with you. We met with the program advisory board for career services, you know, and, and before we even started the meeting, I said, OK, here's what I want to know. What's the number one thing our students lack in when they come to work for you? And they looked at me like, wow, I can't believe somebody asked that. And they said they have no communication skills. You know, the, the soft skills are, are, are terrible. And so that started this 30 minute conversation just on that one thing alone. But we learned so much from that conversation about what it is our employers expect from us. And, and then that led to what can we do for you? Um, and, and I think that's true for your academic programs, for your career tech programs. I think it's true for workforce, especially um, with so many federal dollars available, especially for workforce training programs. Um, I think you've got to have a president who speaks that language and can go out and tell that story. Any questions? Go ahead. John, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Mr. Chairman, I'm fine. I'd like to see the, the set questions asked and then any follow up questions following all the set questions. Well, I think the context is I'm about to quote him and what you're saying. I have a question for you. I'll quote you. The money speaks to what your values are. Um, as a leader of this institution, would you refuse to accept the golden parachute in your contract? So I also recall in the talks you did earlier today, uh, you talked about how the board pushed out the CEO and he had a multi-million dollar contract. Yeah. I believe 20 million. Dollars. It was a bunch, yeah. And it took all the money from the college. I imagine. No, no, no. This is the private, the private institution he did. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, that company. Yes. So yeah, he rated he rated their cash return. Calling those feelings and um being the public image of the community and business partners. Um how do you know what's your stance on the golden parachute in your contract? I've honestly never been aware of a community college president that had one. So it's not something that I would expect. Um, Is it something you would accept? Or would you refuse to be out of principle? I haven't, I don't know how to answer that right now. I'll be honest with you. That's that's one I wasn't expecting. Um, if you're talking about a, a buyout clause, um, essentially, then what I what I would say is is that um you know, obviously, if you're terminating a person without with calls, I mean, there there should be no money there. Now, if you just want somebody to leave early, you know, and you want to buy them out, I mean, if, if that's up to the board, if that's what they want to do, then I would say that's under their purview, and then that person could accept or reject it. I, I mean, I really don't know to, to answer your question what I would do in that situation. Sorry. Yeah, I do have one more question. I'll go ahead. No, I'm going to ask the next question here, but go ahead. You want to go ahead then? Um, I, guess, I, I, um, I guess it is a pertinent question because it's been indicated to me by other trustees that that is in, uh, designed and intended to do to um, tie future boards options and stuff. Because if you don't know, there's a big election in November and um, these three trustees were appointed and I'm sure you guarantee they're not going to get reelected. And so, uh, if you would uh, maybe uh, consider it and respond uh, back in an open forum session, I'd be appreciative of that. Okay. Pete, you want to go ahead? There's a question. Ron, you answer some of this with your, your 4DX and your WIX on the first question, but what type of programming and curriculum innovations have you implemented to increase student retention, completion? graduation and persistence rates. Well, and you hit on something with persistence. That's going to be one of our next goals as part of our strategic plan. We just got through rewriting the plan and we we revolved it around three different themes that I was fortunate to be able to write. And that was people and processes and partners. And so one of one of our metrics that we're going to keep uh, absolutely is going to be our two-year persistence rate because that's something that, that, that we're concerned about. Um, one of the things that we're also concerned about is our dual credit situation. It's like the wild west right now where we are with, with dual credit. 
um, in that not only do we offer dual credit, but our sister four-year four institutions offer it oftentimes at the same schools. And when I first got to ACTC, students only paid 30%. So that, that was the discounted rate on tuition. Now we've gotten that up to 50. And so there's this whole idea of do we lose money? I don't know. I don't think we do. But, but what I do know is that those students come in and they'll take some of those dual credit classes and then they won't matriculate to the institution. Whereas they, they used to, we used to have students who would come straight to ACTC from high school, as they would say, to take their basics. Now they don't do that anymore. They take a bunch of dual credit classes and they bypass us and they go on to a four year university because the four years have done a really good job since their enrollments have been low, low luring those students and telling them, just bring all your dual credit. And, and come to us. Um, so besides those things, and you know, the enrollment issue is not something we can we can really solve in the short term because not only are we seeing the shrinking enrollments that we've had, but it's exacerbated by the fact that the high school and high school graduating classes are smaller. And then we're fighting the value proposition uh, right now in Kentucky really, really hard. They've done a number of surveys and our citizens in the Commonwealth just don't think there's any value in having a having a post-secondary credential. Um, we're combating that in an interesting fashion. Um, I volunteered to be part of a group um, that's, that's brand new in the Commonwealth and just made a three year commitment. It's called the Kentucky uh, Graduate Profile Academy. And so, what we are looking at is a response to this value proposition of higher ed. How do we convince people that it's good to have a post secondary credential? Because our goal in Kentucky is that 60% of the population have a post secondary credential by 2032. And that comes straight from CPE. So what we're looking at is we've identified 10 workplace skills, um, things like, and, and there are things that your gen ed people here will absolutely recognize because they, several of them are, are in the leap outcomes that are used in a lot of institutions for gen ed purposes, but it's communication, it's problem solving, it's teamwork, it's leadership. It's, it's a lot of them are those soft skills. How can we infuse those into the curriculum? We want to find a way to show employers that the students are in fact getting these skills and so that when they get out regardless of whether you have a four-year degree a two-year degree a certificate whatever then you've got students who are work ready and so that's that's really our focus right now and getting that message across to the citizens of the commonwealth that there is value in higher ed and we're hoping that pays some dividends we are about a year into the project so one of the things that we're looking at doing at our institution is we are looking at um, micro credentials or badging, and we're going to we're going to offer our students as they move through their AA or their AAS program as they attain these skills, and we've still got to do the curricular mapping on it to make sure we've got everything in alignment. That those students will be able to earn those, and they're going to actually have an electronic transcript with a company called Accredible that we partnered with, so that they can take that to employer to an employer in addition to their credential. To show them that I do in fact have these skills. They're, they're more or less KCTCS certified, as, as I think what we're thinking about calling it. We're still kicking around the, the, the nomenclature. But in addition to that, we've partnered with the Ashland Alliance, which is our local chamber of commerce. And we've created what's called a work readiness certificate. And so through our career services, we also do boot camp training and things like resume writing. Um, we do mock interviews and things like that. Again, trying to get these skills instilled in these students. So that hopefully, so we're trying to reverse engineer this. We're trying to create a product that we can then market uh, to, to people in the community, and hopefully that's going to solve some of those um, some of those enrollment uh, issues that are absolutely looming. Because let's face it, fewer students are coming to college. Thank you. Any further questions regarding this question? Yeah, types of programming, curriculum innovations. Yes. Um, What's your stance on uh, CRT curriculum and even social justice programming when it comes to uh, incorporation of all values in um, through the college? So we're talking about critical race theory and social justice. Well, just meeting accreditation requirements and um, yeah. Well, I don't know of any accreditation requirements that exist out there for for teaching the things that you that you talk about. Um, We've got a cultural component um, in Kentucky that we have that's embedded. We have a cultural competency um, that we expect students to meet. Um, and one of our one of our institutions is actually developing a, a micro credential for that that we're working on. Um, you know, I I'll be honest, I don't I don't get into the politics of that. Um, I think that in in dealing with 
diversity, equity, and inclusion, the focus needs to be on how can we move the needle as an institution. And what we do know is that with underrepresented minority groups, there is a gap. There's a gap, and right now in our state, it's, it's about 10 percent. We are under a mandate in Kentucky that we have to do a diversity plan every year. Um, there's metrics that we have to meet for graduation, for retention, um, and things like that. And if we don't meet that, I can't offer academic pro. I can't offer a new academic program at our institution. Um, and so we've we've uh, done a lot of efforts in that regard. We've added two new positions at the institution. Um, we've got a full time uh, person who is our senior fellow in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so that's where we are right now. We recently had um, our cultural competency committee. They revamped the standards for that. Um, but the word social justice theory and critical race theory, those were never used. Um, they, they just weren't. What, what we do teach is a, is a healthy respect for all cultures and what students need to know to exist in a multicultural um, society. Very good. It's been easy answer. <laughs> All right. Um, I have noticed that black on black crime is is a significant problem, um, and I actually have a heart for those in Chicago where there's more murders than there are days in the year. Uh, there's multiple per per day. Would you be open to spearheading a cultural diversity program that would partner with at risk youth at basically institutions at very vulnerable places? That are very culturally diverse than 99% white Idaho, and uh, spearheading that in the Idaho here, maybe for like a summer, have some bring the kids for a month or whatever the case. Well, I, I mean, I've, I've always tried to be involved in efforts like that. Um, now I'm from Mississippi, and so Mississippi has the highest percentage African American population in the country. So we were about 45% African American students at our institution. Many of them uh, did come from high poverty backgrounds, and so as, as you probably saw in my uh, in my cover letter, that I've, I've done a couple of camps for at-risk youth uh, back in Mississippi that I ran. Um, have, have done those. Those were those were pretty successful, and we were, we were able to produce college graduates out of those programs. So so we're very proud of those efforts. Um, Kentucky, uh, we're uh, probably racially made, made up the same. You know, in Ashland, where I am, we're 94 percent white. Um, it's a little harder to meet those diversity metrics. It just is. Um, but I think that it's I think that it's worth doing. Um, but we've still got, even though we're 94 percent white, we've got some of the most gut wrenching abject poverty I've ever seen in parts of Kentucky. And it, it, it has no respect for race um, with with your question um, about at risk. Yes, I think we need to, to be there for all of our at risk students. Absolutely. I just like to point out also, thank you for also providing an example. And it was not me who pulled it out of your biography of a question that was based off of information in our packet. So. As part of our open meeting discussion. Thank you. Next question What would be your short term strategy to increase enrollment in the current competitive landscape? You've touched on this some. I think we've got to be innovative with our scheduling. That's one of the things that, that I haven't talked about. We've got to find the right mix, regardless of where you are on programming. I was I was doing some comparison data between uh, the last institution I was at, the one I'm at now, and, and, and this one, looking at the mix. At ACTC, we're about a 30-30-30 mix. We've got about a third of our students are completely online, about a third of our students are completely on campus, and another third are, are a mix. And so providing a schedule for that, especially when you're as lean as we are uh, with the number of employees, is incredibly difficult. So one of the things that I started when I got there is we have a huge meeting every semester, and I, I call it Schedule Summit. Um, it's not really original, but um, I bring in the enrollment management people. I bring in some program coordinators, some of the, some of the instructors, some of the best minds on campus that I can find, and we talk about the schedule and what are the what are the tweaks, what are the changes that we can make so that the schedule is more friendly to the students, and what schedule is going to bring the most students um, in, into our into our roles, and and so. We, we learned a lot from that first one we had. We realized we needed to add more hybrid classes, for example. Well, then the pandemic hit. So the work kind of got, got put on hold a little bit. But what we did discover through the pandemic was the high flex model seems to work really well. Um, we've actually got a class that we're going to do this fall. I'm very excited about where we got uh, an instructor to agree. Um, she wanted to teach this psychology class. 
And so on our, our two primary campuses, she never could get a class to make enrollment wise. She couldn't get enough students to justify having a class. So she has agreed she's going to do a Tuesday, Thursday high flex class where Tuesday will be taught at one campus, Thursday will be taught at the other. The students will share a blackboard component shell. So it'll essentially be the same class split over two campuses. So we're having to be innovative in things like that to make sure that our students are getting what they need. We've done everything. We've done focus groups with our students to see what they want and we come up with a mixed bag of results. So this fall, what we're going to try to do is figure out what, what we don't have right now at ACTC is we don't have a really cohesive model for if I'm a student who comes in and I want to work on a, a, a gen ed degree, either AA or AS, and I want all of my classes in person, we don't really we don't really have that. And so that's going to be our challenge is to, to put what I call a, a good boots on the ground schedule for an AA and an AS student so that we can advertise that because I'm convinced that there are some students who went through the pandemic where everything went online in their high schools and they didn't like it and they want in-person classes, but we've got to be able to provide that. But we're going to have to really be, we're going to have to have to be careful in how we do it because of our lack of faculty. But I, but I think we can, that's going to be our challenge this fall. Your gut feeling for sense is what the students have been telling administrators all during the pandemic. We want to be in person. We want to be in person. That's a major desire here. Um, do you have any ideas maybe related to sports? Like, for example, there's an idea that's been tossed to me before about, do you think adding baseball and women's wrestling, they're kind of big trending on Twitter these days, um, are good moves to boost enrollment within the next year? I, I think that, it, that if you can afford to add the sport, I think it's a great move. That is one of the things that we did in Meridian to bolster our enrollment. Now, we had, I think, a few more beds than you all do. We had, we had three dormitories and we had a set of apartments. And so our, our biggest challenge was how do we fill all of those? And so athletics was definitely a way to do that. And the, the last teams that we added were the men's and women's track team. And that brought 80 students to campus. So it was it was absolutely a, a, a savior um, for, for enrollment and for filling those beds. I think I think that if you've got bed space, I think it's absolutely a, a good move to make. you got to consider, though, the other things like travel and and things like that. But uh, but yeah, I can certainly see validity in that. I've got a, a friend in another state who's a president. And that's exactly what he's doing. And he is actually going to, um, in, in their dorms where they've had single beds, they're going to bunk beds so they can bring another team in. So uh, I think you've got to be creative in how you how you approach these, these enrollment lows. Another question? Yeah. If you come to even a basketball game, and I love our basketball game, but ever since we've been in NWAC, the attendance to basketball games has been starkly down compared to when we were in NJCAA. What is, would that be a venue that we would consider to push them off? I mean, if, if it were if it were economically feasible, yes. I mean, because you got part of what you got to look at is the bottom line. I mean, I, I know the, the, the budget here is really good. I, you know, I've, I've poured over the budget and the college is in really good financial shape, but you've got to look long term. So I, I would look at that. We had a situation in Mississippi where we pulled out of one league and went to another, and we ended up going back because um, it was cost prohibitive to keep doing what we were doing uh, because of the distance we had to travel to get games. Um, I understand your concern, though, the legitimacy of playing NJCAA Division One sports. I mean, it's what people know. It's no different than a, a kid who grows up and would rather play D1. Uh, NCAA sports instead of Division II, three or NAI. So those are definitely conversations I would be interested in having. I don't know enough about the background of this particular issue, though, to really make a statement on what I would or wouldn't do. Are there any further questions? John, do you want to give question number five? I'm fine, thank you. That means he wants me to go. <laughs> Give us an example of innovative strategies that you have deployed to retain and attract high performing talent. I think that's the toughest issue that we all face right now, especially during what, you know, what everyone terms has been the great resignation and it's certainly affected higher ed. For us, the hardest position to fill has been nursing positions, uh, nursing faculty, because the, the way that we are set up, you know, we we don't actually control the salaries that we pay. Those are set by the system office, and so they give us the starting salary, and everybody starts at the same rate of pay. Unfortunately, for the nurses, 
the mean salary for a nurse in the state of Kentucky is twice what that person can start out teaching at. And so that word's out. And the pandemic only exacerbated this because the travel money became so big that so many nurses started traveling. And then the burnout from nurses leaving the profession has just left our ranks decimated. We, we've had uh, multiple meetings this summer, me and my CAO colleagues, and we're asking ourselves, how in the world are we going to fill all these positions? Because while we are short and trying to fill them, I've got three nursing vacancies right now. I'm hoping when I get home that we've got a new pool of applicants we can begin to interview. We've got the state of Kentucky simultaneously telling us we need more nurses. We need more nurses. You've got to enlarge your programs. So it's a, it's, it's a tough nut to crack. I think that everyone is looking for now, and this is every article I read in every business journal in America, people are looking for perks. They're looking for those things that work that you can get maybe that aren't salary related. The biggest one, of course, everyone wants is they want to work remotely. And unfortunately, everyone can't work remotely. And that's, that's, that's the, the, the biggest thing. I think that's the hardest thing to, to explain to people when you're trying to hire and hire ed is we need you here. You know, students need to be able to converse with you. Students need to be able to come in. Students are taking classes on your campus. And, and we don't have any faculty that I know of um, in the state of Kentucky that are online only that are hired by institutions. So I think we can do things like help people attain higher degrees. Um, you know, for instance, you could hire a person in who had an associate's degree in nursing or a bachelor of science, and you could help them, you know, on their educational journey attain the next degree. Um, you know, we've got uh, we've got a good foundation in our college that, that helps people out with that. And I think there's some programs that can that can be started that so it's it's finding those those enticements. You you've got to incentivize it. You're gonna to have to incentivize it. It used to be that it was simply if the prestige of teaching at a higher ed institution, the schedule, the summers off, and those types of things were enough, but unfortunately, because of the state of the economy, it's just not enough. So we're going to have to be creative in how we do that. On the tech side, it's even more difficult because we've got so many, there's such a lack of skilled trades people out there. And, and we're losing, we're losing instructors all the time in our trades programs because they're going out in the field to make money. And so we we've been fortunate enough to be able to rely on, for example, maybe in an HVAC program or a welding program, you get someone who's been doing the job for 20 or 25 years and their body, they just can't take it anymore. So they want to teach and they've got that knowledge and, and that's great. But those people are even becoming harder and harder to find because wages are just so high in the, in the skilled trades. I think that one of the things that might solve that long term, I don't know. Um, we were in some early talks about it. I presented it to the chancellor at KCTCS is to possibly find some people out there who already have bachelor's degrees and who maybe want to come back and learn a skilled trade and develop that faculty, have a pipeline to do that. And I say that because we hired an HVAC person who really kind of turned me on to the idea. He was a person who had gone to Marshall University and he had gotten a bachelor's degree in education and he was teaching high school history. And then later he went back and he apprenticed as an HVAC, uh, as an HVAC technician. Well, then he wanted to be an HVAC instructor. You talk about a great instructor. When you take someone who already has the training in education and methodologies and pedagogy and then has also worked and has also worked in the field. And then he came back and was really excited about about teaching students. I can really see that as part of the future of, of technical education. If you can find a way to build that bridge to bring those people across. Any other questions on this subject? Yeah. Okay. okay. I've uh, experienced and noticed um, People in this institution seem more loyal to the president than the mission. And for example, uh, people were so upset they're assaulting people in the midst of our board meetings on their way out of leaving. If you haven't noticed that video, I can get that video for you. Because, um, and uh, basically, when trustees are trying to do the best for the institution, uh, obviously, you have uh, members who um, are essentially revolting against that. Uh, we got to attract and retain high performing talent. Where does the line come from essentially loyalty oath to sticking to the mission and focusing and uh, following policies and not playing favoritism with playing uh, following policy? My focus is always on the mission of the institution. I think that's the great equalizer. That's the thing that I talk to myself about when I get up in the morning and before I go to bed. It sounds corny, but I actually ask myself the question, you know, what did you do to impact the mission of ACTC on a daily basis. 
And if I can't answer that question in an affirmative way, I feel really bad. Now, I know everybody's not like that. I don't, you know, loyalty is important to me, but not not to a fault. But I think loyalty to the institution is is, is a thing that I feel very strongly about. And, and I think if you're if your institution's mission statement is is written like it should be and yours is um, and we're doing what we're, we're supposed to be doing in that mission and that is we're educating citizens we're providing post-secondary credentials we are preparing people for the workforce we're preparing students for transfer then that's my focus um, I mean I just I don't I don't have any I don't have time in my day to focus on anything else it's you know these jobs are incredibly demanding and taxing and so uh, again, that's one that I keep going back to it and I apologize, but that's why we instituted 40X because it keeps the focus on what the focus should be on and that's moving the needle. I did notice in during your uh, two briefings earlier, you talked about employees and mentorship and stuff and how yes. it, it yes. seemed like you were honestly, even though it's you're in my program and you're trained so well, you know, do what's best for you and move on. I'm impressed with that attitude. Um, well, I had a question though. Uh, where where do you draw the line of um, sticking to the mission and what's best for the college compared to like what's best for you? As, a, as an administrator, as a president, now I've, I've obviously got my professional goals. Um, but but those still have to run secondary to what's best for the institution. And if and I think if it's if I were fortunate enough to get this job and there were ever a time when the best thing for the institution would be for me to resign, then that's what I would do. Um, because the 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 institution itself is much bigger than anybody here. And I you know I, I stopped I stopped a long time ago. You know you can't you can't think that I'm bigger than the institution. I don't think anybody can have that mindset because. Um, I, I watched it happen. I had a colleague and a, and a dear friend who was a faculty member back in 2017. Um, he was a theater instructor. He worked for me for 10 years. I watched him drop dead in the hallway. I mean, in front of me. Guy died of a heart attack in front of me and my son. And, you know, as tragic an event as it was, 24 hours later, we're having meetings for how are we going to continue on with the functions that he was doing. So it, it really kind of made a, an impact on me in that the institution is going to outlast all of us, but it's what's important. The institution, what it stands for, what it does, what it does for the community and the way that it changes lives, those have to supersede everything else. The, the president is just the, the chief executive officer. That person's there for a short time and, and they have to be the caretaker of the institution. That's how I see it. I just want to have full disclosure. Um, you're coming into an institution where the board is going to sleep for 10 years and all of a sudden the board is active and starting to ask questions when I got elected and my fellow colleagues got elected. And I've observed, and if you look at the stats and for the building, for the um, student wellness recreation building, that building was built essentially to put a resume, um, a stack people's resumes for the next steps in life. And how would you, obviously that the uh, board's responsibility is to be on watch out for that. Um, but how would you basically be on alert and do you have any, do you have any ideas for an institution that would, uh, other than just being president and not on your watch, um, that not having that happen? Well, I, I think you have to, in, I think you have to instill a culture of accountability with people. And I think you have to know what's going on. And I think that um, at every level of supervision, you have to know what's going on. And I think the more that people know what goes on in the institution that precludes those things from happening. Is there any way to stop something like that from happening? You know, no. And I, and I, I wish I knew of a way to do that. Um, I told I told our faculty coming in because they asked me the question. They said, well, how long are you going to be here? Are you just are you just here so you can go be a president? And I said, well, that's kind of a loaded question. I said, um, no, I'm, I'm here because I won't be CAO of ACTC. Do I want to be a president? Yes, I said, I absolutely do. And I'll give you that with full disclosure. What I don't want to do is I don't want to do it off your backs. So I don't want to load you down with work to make me look good so that I can then go be a president. Um, and when I said that, um, some of the some of the, the guarded feelings started to come down. I said, because A, it's not right. And B, I, you know, I, I don't I don't need that. You know, I, I, I can do this. If I'm, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it on my own merits. I don't know if that fully answered your question, but you need perspective. 
Thank you, Greg. I think I'm going to move us along. Some of your questions can be answered later on, I think, with the questions that we ask. But save your questions. I'm not cutting any questions off. Question number six. How would you describe the financial condition of NIC? Where would you focus your attention? <clears throat> Provide us the best examples that reflect your ability to mansion, manage NIC finances today and post-pandemic. I'll tell you that fiscally, I'm very conservative. Um, I, I did like what I saw when I read the budget. It's about the same size as we had at Meridian. I think our budget was 45 million. Yours is about 50. Um, there was a healthy fund balance, which is always a good thing. Um, and I understand that the institution is out of debt. So those things are absolutely fantastic. That was the same situation I left um, at Meridian. I was, I've been fortunate in the jobs that I've had that I've had to manage money. Um, with fine arts, I had the largest academic budget on campus, um, and I also had access to a, a lot of funds in the foundation office because we had a, a pretty big donor that had left a really large uh, sum of money for us for fine arts programming. But we always tried to be good stewards of those funds, and um, I always tried to I always try. My goal was always to give money back at the end of the fiscal year. Now, I know that can backfire on you. There's some people that don't believe in that, but my thought was is a good CFO will reward those efforts, and, and, and I found that um, that if you're fiscally conservative, then those things do get rewarded. I believe in having a healthy fund balance. I'll tell you that that's important. We've done the same thing in Kentucky. We've got a fairly healthy fund balance. Um, we uh, we do a lot of things where we, we have a lot of discussions on how we spend money, even. And for me, even even when I have discretionary authority over funds where I can just with a stroke of the pen spend money, I oftentimes bring other people into the discussion because I want to make sure that I'm being a good steward of taxpayer dollars. But that to me, is probably the single biggest uh, function that the, the president serves is that fiduciary trust that exists between the taxpayers uh, and that person. So, you know, wasted monies, things we don't need, you know, those are things I would absolutely be watchful for. Keeping the budget in balance and in check. But from what I've seen, um, you all have a really healthy budget. I noticed that you've upped the amount that you're going to pay for credit hour for uh, adjunct construction, which I think is good because I think it's becoming harder to find those instructors. That's a problem we have uh, at Ashland. We've also had to, to up the amounts that we pay because we've got to be competitive and we've got a lot of sister institutions um, around us competing. Um, and so we've got a, a, a regional university in Ohio right across the river and you know they can pay a thousand dollars more for the same class that I'm offering. So uh, those things become become very tough. But but I I, I really like the uh, the financial position you're in. Now that being said, the pandemic dollars are not coming in anymore. We've all spent our hurt funds. So this is going to be uh, for everybody. This is going to be a tough time because those monies aren't going to be rolling in. But we've got to find ways to replace those funds, whether those are through grants, whether those are through donors. We've got to get back to the business of raising money the way that we did it before. The pandemic came and the, and the, and the government started to, to send them send the money to us. Any questions? Am I allowed to ask questions or not? Yeah, sure. Number five, right? No, no, no. Seven? No, six. Number six. Number seven. You're on number seven. Number six was uh, how would you describe the financial condition of NIC? Yeah, you have a question on that. Oh, question. Yes. Okay. Um, the college just got a uh, what's, what's the loan interest rate? The college rating, the college debt rating, I believe it was. Uh, are you, are you aware of that? Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Moody rate. Thank you. Uh, just went down. Um, and then the newspapers made a big stink about it. And then what do you know that they come out for all colleges and do the same thing about three, four months later. Right. Um, but of course we made the newspaper and got into the fear factor because that's politics. Um, how, how do you think that impacts North Idaho College moving forward? I don't think it does if they did it with everybody. I think that there's there may be a perception out there that's short term, but I also think the bond rate is going to go up over time. And especially if I'm in a situation where I don't have debt and I have healthy reserves, I'm not really concerned about it, to be honest. That sounds like a flipping answer, but I promise it's not. No, it's a, it's a right answer because if you look at the interest rate and the payment that we'd be doing on loan, it's minuscule. So I'm glad to hear. Chair Wold. John, yes. I just I just want to give Dr. Brand a, a quick time check, let time check and let him know he's doing 
really well on time. We're at question number seven. We started at about 435, 440, somewhere in there, and we've budgeted an hour and a half for this interview. So we're doing great on time. I just wanted to, to give Dr. Brand a, uh, uh, just a quick time check. Thank you. Do you have another question relating to number six? And if you don't, you can read number seven. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Number seven, describe your fundraising experience. What will be your approach to building successful donor relationships in our region? Well, as far as from a total college perspective, I, I don't have a lot. I, I will tell you that um, my president has been very good in, in teaching me the fundraising game, and uh, he's allowed me to work with a couple of big donors at the, at the institution. We were able to procure a very large uh, endowment from, from one donor, uh, my first or second year there, I forget, they run together, um, but it created a pretty prestigious award for a faculty member. There was already one award that had been established for a math science faculty member years ago, and so the humanities and social sciences faculty had kind of gotten, they felt left out over the years, and so they really wanted one of these awards, and so Dr. Ferguson and I went um, and had meetings with his family to see if they were willing to endow a second in, endow chairs award and, and really in significant amounts. And so we were able to do that. Um, but over my career in every position I've had from coaching on, I've had to raise funds. You know, if you're a high school basketball coach like I was, you know, I came through at a time where extracurricular activities weren't paid for by the school, so you had to fundraise. It's it's all I've ever done. When I, when I got the, the chairs job uh, in fine arts, this was before we had the, the big uh, donation from, from a, a member of the community, and so we had to raise funds there. Um, I also worked with our foundation director in the entirety of my career at MCC on fundraising campaigns. Um, uh, some of those were done in-house with faculty trying to get people to, to become donors to the college. Some was out of the community. I helped her do drives there. And then there was one donor that, that I got to work with, with her especially, who was a, a gentleman from Colorado who had been uh, at our institution about 20 years earlier. Um, and we were, we were able to procure a million dollar donation from him for a new building. And I was instrumental with helping with that one. Um, but it's, it's limited experience in fundraising, I'll be honest. I don't know anyone ever going to ask questions. All right, I got plenty of questions on this. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'll take my job serious. Um, you're coming in, to in, you're coming to an institution that's essentially captive by the NIC Foundation. So there'll, there'll be uh, plenty of uh, fundraising advice to come along with it. And things is uh, starting the president uh, does what he's told. It seems like it, everything will go well. Is uh, the story I've noticed. Um, uh, that he's had 18 years on the foundation. I believe he's had 15 years. His, his boss works for the foundation, so it kind of shows the representation that we have here. That those, that's the crowd that we definitely want to connect with. Um, Do you have a question? Or yes, I have a question. Do you think, beyond just the NIC Foundation for Scholarships and Extra Scholarships, uh, the booster clubs, um, as is your institution, was there separate or was there one foundation? Or um, how did that work? We have one. We have one foundation. One foundation. Yes, sir. So, and so the fact that we have two and that one doesn't even have a board representative, that seems. Um, okay. Uh, what would be your approach to building successful donor relationships in the region? Would, have you built a relationship with a bunch of the uh, lead in, in industry in your area that you come from? Yes, I've got good relationships with our largest employers. Um, our two biggest employers are Marathon Petroleum. They actually... Uh, they, they're a lot of people don't know this, but their refinery is in Catlinsburg, Kentucky, which is right down the road from the college. Um, and we've got a, a program where we train operators to go into the refinery there. It's called Applied Process Technology. Uh, it's, it's an older program at the college that's been there for a long, long time. So I have regular meetings with the HR director um, and some of the vice presidents there. They also have a spinoff company, Marathon Marine, who we also have a good relationship with. Is, is um, We recently put in a marine deck pad so that we can train deckhands for entry level positions on the barges on the river. Um, we also have a really good relationship. Um, I you know, know the CEO of the hospital there, Christy Whitlatch at King's Daughters. 
um, we do a lot of things with King's Daughters because once Our Lady of Belfont closed, they were our last hospital in town. And so they're, they're it as far as healthcare unless you go across the river to Huntington. And so we've been in the process of meeting with representatives from that hospital. Gosh, they're they're working me hard to put in uh, a lot of new programming. And so right now we're simultaneously working on radiography and medical assisting. We put in EKG a year ago. I created a new pathway um, with uh, our LPN coordinator, a new pathway for uh, to bridge from LPN to RN that I think was innovative. Um, and so that's that's our that's our two biggest employers in the area. So it's it's healthcare and then the, the, the petroleum industry. Uh, doling out scholarships. Do you have any experience with that? Yes. Um, being being the fine arts chair, we we were one of the few academic areas where we were just like athletics. We had a pretty big scholarship budget, um, and we we raised a lot of money though to, to be able to do that. And because we made so much money off of our shows that we produced, you know, the the, the president would allow scholarship funds to be set aside for us. And then we had other scholarships in the foundation. So we had we had two ways. We had institutional scholarships and then we had foundation scholarships. So I, I was involved with both of those. Can you experience anyone else have a question? Can you experience did, have you encompassed any uh Inappropriate like steering of scholarships that you've had to address or anything like that, or because NIC here has even had several scholarship uh, scandals uh, that have had to deal in the past 10 years. No, we did everything by committee um, with our institutional scholarships and then our foundation scholarships. They usually were named scholarships and they had certain criteria you had to meet. And so, you know, if the student applied for those, then each one of those had its own committee that awarded. So that's that's how it was done. So it was never it was never one person who decided who was gonna to get these things or that steered money. Uh, I have one question from the earlier one. Um, for number six, you described how the financial condition of NIC, um, ability to manage NIC foundations today and post pandemic. Would you describe how, as a chief academic officer, how often would you meet with like the CFO? Um, I meet with Dean Blevins regularly. You know, we have to because we've had a lot of a lot of big expenditures that we've made with her funds, and of course she's going around the campus trying to distribute those, you know, her funds equitably. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were in line for things that we wanted to do. Um, a couple of things that that I was able to do. One was we created a nursing lab for testing. That was something that was sorely needed. Um, as I told, as I said in the forums earlier, when I came in, we, we kind of had some problems with our associate degree nursing program in that we'd had low inflex for us for a couple of years and we were, we were, we were going to be in some hot water if we didn't, you know, pick that up. And so that was one of the things that I committed to do. And we were able to use, uh, to her funds to build a, a state of the art testing facility for the nurses. Uh, another thing we did is we put cameras in all of our classrooms, really good cameras so that we could do high flex classes. Um, do uh, live blackboard sessions when students couldn't come to class. So teachers came to their classrooms and taught during the pandemic with no students and they would live stream those classes out. Um, we did a huge renovation on our, on our welding lab. Uh, we have the largest welding lab in the state of Kentucky. It is the crown jewel of our, of our institution. I can tell you that at one time we were ranked the third uh, best welding program in the country. We actually run three shifts of welders at ACTC. The first shift starts at 6 a.m. The last shift ends at 2 a.m. Three different groups of students. The instructors have overlap, overlapping schedules. We've got a really good relationship with the local union, the 248 steam their pipe fitters, and they grab those students as fast as we can train them. Um, so a lot of credentials uh, issued that way. That renovation cost, I think, about $750,000, give or take a few. And then I'm doing a renovation of our theater right now, too, which I did previously at MCC. Um, but without the dollars that I had at MCC, we were able to use some HERP funds for some of that because we use it as a classroom space. And so now we're trying to be creative and figure out how we can finish the project. We've replaced the line sets. Uh, we're going to replace the draperies next. New audio is coming in because the theater hadn't been upgraded in a long, long time. You mentioned the three rounds of welding. Um, I noticed sadly I was trying to get a student into welding and automotive classes at our apartment that was in Tiki. And uh, they only start in August. And then and there's not there's only one shift a day and that kind of stuff. I think that's definitely one easy way to boost 
um, students is to offer have more offerings, more regular starts, start stops. So um, no matter what, what, what result of this, but uh, definitely getting you in contact with our um, CTE people up front there. And you can start in any semester too. You can start in the spring, you can start in the fall. It doesn't matter. You can jump in the program. So that's what that's the direction we, I think we need to head to. <clears throat> Yeah, question eight. What successes have you had in lobbying with regional, state, and national politicians? How will you employ these strategies at NIC? None with national politicians. Um, we in KCTCS, because I'm now, you know, at the cabinet level, um, nobody does any national lobbying. The system employs their own lobbyists, and so they go to DC. Our presidents don't even do it. So it's it's not something that's that's part of their their repertoire. Now in Mississippi, what we did do is we had to do our own lobbying at the state level. And so we all did that. You know, the Mississippi schools, when we had 15 of them, each one would have a week in the year set aside during the legislative term. And Mississippi's legislative term ran from January to April. And so you had a week where the people from your institution, you could take faculty, staff, and so we would get on a van and we would go to the Capitol and we would meet with our legislators. So I've got vast experience in that. Um, I've always made it a point to have a good relationship um, with our local state senator, with our you know our local uh, House of Representatives member. But even more importantly than that, were our county supervisors, because in Mississippi, each of our counties is run by five supervisors. They have five beats of what they used to call them. They call them districts now. But these uh, these community colleges in Mississippi have local taxing power. But the key is they've got to have permission from the county supervisors to how much is paid into the institution. So there's a maximum amount of millage that each supervising district can pay to the institution. And how much you get, that depends on the president and everyone's relationship with that supervisor. So if you want to get funded, you better keep a good relationship with your local supervisor. So that's something that we always made sure that we did. Um, I always kept a good relationship with mine anyway, just because I always thought it was a good thing to do to keep that relationship. The other part that was really tough politically in Meridian was is that we had a five member board of trustees that weren't elected. They were appointed by the mayor of the city of Meridian. So a lot of politics entered into play there. So every time the mayor's position changed hands, then that could change the makeup of the board. The one thing that stopped it from being total upheaval, though, was the terms were staggered every two years. And so um, one a new mayor coming in could only replace two positions during one term. So it it did take a while if you wanted to have total turnover. Um, so I, I have always had good relations um, with our local politicians, our state politicians. At the national level, I don't have any experience. Any questions? Go ahead. Uh, the prior presidents would only meet with uh, basically one. Do uh, you know what central committees are, political central committees? Each county in Idaho, and I think in the country, has uh, central committees as Democrat and Republican central committees. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. And actually, the, the Republican central committee in this town. Um, anyway, uh, would you have any qualms or um, about reaching out to, to those central committees and getting them on board with the mission of the college and doing outreach? It seems like there's prior to four, there's definitely a bias to only one uh, central committee. No, I think, I, see, I think presidents have to be apolitical. They have to reach out to everyone. Our student body makeup is everybody. We, we, if, if we're going to be open access institutions, or we're going to be open to everybody, then we should be open to everybody. And so, I mean, the, the college is a microcosm of the community, and I don't think anybody should be excluded. That's my answer to that. And how would you go about uh, fulfilling the vision of the community that uh, the legislatures have for districts one through five? Um, or, and also, like, that's kind of a general question, but if any of the legislatures wanted to have open forums, open sessions, meetings on community college campus, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? It would depend on what the local laws are, because I don't, I honestly don't know what those are, are, are in Idaho. I mean, you know, we, we had things like that, you know, in Mississippi. We, we don't have a lot of them in Kentucky, although we have, I will say that KCTCS usually tells the presidents, you know, keep the politics off the campuses. So uh, they do a pretty, you know, they, they do a good job of making sure that doesn't happen. But, you know, when we have a mayor's race, when we have a state legislative race, we usually have a forum for those candidates. Uh, we would have it on our campus in our theater. 
Um, and I've, I've, I've moderated one of those before. So, um, so I mean, we, we've done things like that. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, you can't, you can't keep <laughs> the money side of the politics. That's, that's just a, that's a harsh reality of how colleges are funded. So you can't, you can't keep the politics in the college totally separate. But I think what presidents can do, as I said, is they can be a political and they can try to ensure that they're serving the needs of everyone. I think you've answered it, but I'll just clarify. Even if those needs of the other ones are not here, I think that's been the problem for the past five years. It's all about the mission statement. That's why I keep going back to that. The mission is what matters to the institution. I'm going to move on to question nine. Tell us your vision for managing change and innovation. What would be your strategy for ensuring that MIC remain the leader and first choice for education in this region? we got to stay on the cusp of technology. I think it's huge. We've got to train. We've got to think about how to train students for jobs that don't even exist yet. And that's I think that's the hardest part of what higher education is facing because that new technology costs a lot of money. Um, I think that uh, Perkins has really helped us. Perkins funding uh, at ACTC makes some significant investments in technology. We actually had a, a windfall year last year. We had close to a million, uh, half a million dollars that we got from Perkins funding that allowed us to make some upgrades in our automotive department, in our surgical tech program. Um, so we, we've made significant investments into our computerized machining and manufacturing program through those things. So I, I think I think stay keeping the pace on that is extremely important because the technology in some of these industries changes so fast. We got a $250,000 grant from the USDA to bring in a metal 3D printer. We're one of only two schools in the Commonwealth that have a metal 3D printer. We're very excited at the possibilities we can do with additive manufacturing. And we're working on in Kentucky right now, putting together a certificate uh, to train people in the in the 3D print industry. Um, I think that an entrepreneurial spirit is the biggest thing that's going to do that. And my experience, and it's, you know, it's limited. I, I know some presidents. I've studied presidents. Um, you know, this is a really uh, anecdotal what I'm about to say. But I think as, as a person moves into that role, their risk tolerance tends to decline. I think you've got to have innovative entrepreneurial presidents who aren't afraid to fail. And I think they've got to encourage the people that work for them not to be afraid to fail because we're going to have to face the risks. And, and that, I think, is one of the hallmarks of community college education um, that, that we've got to be able to do those things. Um, I just finished up a, a, a series of, 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 I guess, for lack of a better word, it was a program um, training entrepreneurial administrators through uh, higher education innovations. It's a group out of Texas. And that's, that was the theme um, of our eight week series was how to not be risk averse you know, when you're in a position of leadership in an institution, because your natural tendency is to do that. It's, it's to be afraid of failure. It's to put on the brakes. But I don't think we can do that. I think we've got to move forward and we've got we've got to take some chances. Um, you know, we've got to we've got to look at what are the jobs 10 to 15 years from now? How are we going to train people to do that? One of the things we're starting to look at in Kentucky is artificial intelligence. You know, that's going to be uh, that, that's a booming economy right now and it's just going to get bigger. How can we get involved in that, you know, on, on a bigger basis? Um, one of our one of our programs that we're very proud of is our Amazon Cloud Web Services program that we started. Uh, you can get a certificate um, working on the cloud in Amazon, and those are some high paying jobs. You know, some of those jobs are paying six figures for a person with a two year degree who's adept at that. Um, so those are the things that we're really looking at. We work closely with the Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board, KWIB. Um, they've got five industry sectors that we're really targeting right now that are high demand, high wage sectors. Those are healthcare, that's IT, that's construction, um, manufacturing, and transportation. Those are those are all places where we've got a lot of opportunity, and I think we need to seize on those things. Um, speaking of. Before this, before this current interim president, who's done a fabulous job with uh, course management and long range planning, uh, the prior leadership for years, they bumbled and eventually dropped the aero technician programs. 
initially the it, the narrative was we canceled the program and then when the board changed in November and we actually started asking questions that the community was asking uh the narrative then changed to actually we, we didn't cancel it we put it on pause um so my experience is it was seemed like the realization that the prior president didn't have the same vision of the board and didn't have the bravery to, to actually communicate that vision how, how would you handle a scenario like that well the only experience i really have with closing the program um, is the one that i alluded to you know this morning our, our ait program and that we we didn't want to close it it's a viable program it was headed through 20 fortune 500 companies it's absolutely viable but we had such a pr issue um, after the company didn't come in and build a rolling aluminum mill, we we unfortunately had to close it because enrollment dropped to nothing. We literally had no students enrolled in the fall. Um, you know that was a tough call, but we did it. Now we had we've had another couple of low enrollment programs we've hung in there with, and those enrollments those enrollments have rebounded. I mean, I just think it's a, a question of long term. Where do you think this is going to go? Do you do you have the demand for it in your region, or your employers asking for this? You know, and, and why is it you're thinking about closing it? You know, I think it's those motivations will have to come into play. Just to provide more context, like the ERA program came in 2013 and had like a lease escalator, uh, 3% a year, and then basically there was no long range planning, no vision. It wasn't even the, in the five year building plan. People were asleep at the wheel. And what do you know? We're paying $9,000 a month um just to keep a program that you know has marginal amounts of students and then with the pandemic and stuff it, um, so how how would you engage the, the prior it, just didn't seem to have a vision so the five-year building plan um well, have, what's your experience with long-range building planning to support future mission uh, future uh course needs well i mean i have very little because of the positions that i've held in higher ed you know i mean that's that's largely, you know, a presidential function, or it's the person who oversees the director of maintenance. You know, those are your primary players there. So, coming from an academic background, I, I don't have a lot of that. But I imagine you could pick it up pretty quickly. I mean, you, you look at where the money's going and what the future needs are, and um, sure. I'm hoping so anyway. And I hope you believe that. <laughs> uh, one more thing regarding the era program you ask a question you get different answers multiple times it seems um how would you engage your board and provide straightforward information to trustees well we we actually looked at uh, about a year ago um the president tasked me he said i want you to go through all the academic programs and we need to look at what's viable and what's not because things have gotten a little tight um, you know, all the COVID money uh, was was gone. And so, you know, we really wanted to take a hard look at our programs. And so I, I created a, a formula. I don't know if it's right or not, but I did create a, a formula for whether or not programs were viable that took into account uh, the cost of, we, we looked at, we looked at the cost of the materials that were necessary to run the program. We looked at the instructor salary. We looked at the benefits, um, just any cost that we could find associated with the program. Then we looked at the enrollment, we calculated the dollars, and we tried to put some kind of multiplier on it that made a little bit of sense. And you know, that's 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 how we determined whether or not the programs were viable or not. We looked at it strictly from an economic standpoint. There were a couple though where they were kind of on the fence, like I said, but the local employers really wanted them and, and they wanted them to stay there. And we thought they might rebound and they weren't costing us any money. That was that was the main thing. We didn't have any that were money losers. Um, and so I, I think that there are cases where you could have a low enrollment program and if it's not costing the institution money, um, then it's not hurting anything. Now, if it is, then then you've got some hard decisions to make. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> what, what is your opinion of trustee? Well, you said one question. Well, I got follow-up questions. Am I not allowed to ask follow-up questions? Would you like to limit my questions? I am trying to get through all the questions in the time allotted. So go ahead. I'm just trying to interview candidates. What's your opinion of trustee involvement in meetings and when we're trying to get straightforward information? So like, I'll just even throw an example of a policy out there. I think if, the, if there's a meeting where food's even present, um, you know, like you had lunch today at a meeting with President's Council or any meeting on campus, really, because that's I went to some GLI leadership trainings and that was honestly a policy of some colleges that a trustee was a welcome to the tent. What, what's your view on that? 
as hard should they be involved in those things? I mean, I'm I'm trying to see where you're going with this. The question is like, how engaged should the trustee be, and how invited on campus should trustees be? Um, what's your view of trustees? I mean, the the trustees are the they're the the employer of the president. Um, you know, and, and I don't think anybody should feel unwelcome on the campus. I do think that there is a there's a clear chain of command in the, the president um, and, and anybody else that's being reported to the board, you know, should do that and see if those have probably got a huge role there. Um, I know that was the case for NCC. We had a huge report by our CFO every time we had a board meeting. Um, was, the, was the board ever on campus on a regular basis? No, but that didn't mean they couldn't be. They just had their jobs that they did on a daily basis. And there was a there was an implicit trust that existed between them and the president that I that I hope would be there, you know, in this case. Um, I mean, I would never want anybody to feel unwelcome anywhere. Um so uh, do you view trustees as assets for an institution or general liabilities? I don't know that I'd view them either way. I mean, they're they're necessary. You, you've got to have <laughs> You, you got to have someone at the top. You, you got to have somebody that's ultimately responsible for the institution. And you were mentioning before the meeting, it's, it's a fiduciary responsibility. So um, there, there's got to be someone there. I don't I don't see how there could be, or I don't know how you would you would have operation in the rest of the institution unless it went directly to the state. And that doesn't really appeal to me. Uh, the way we've got it set up in Kentucky, um, our institutions, they have a local board of trustees, but the presidents really report to the president of KCTCS. Not wild about that setup. Um, and then there's a board of regents that governs it all. So there's a lot of layers of government administration there that's not really my cup of tea. Um, so local board of trustees is, is really what, what I was looking for as far as governance of an institution goes. Do you have a follow-up question specific to that? I've uh approved two budgets where the questions haven't really been uh, asked about why we have um, nine years ago we had about 9,000 full-time equivalent students and now we have about 3,500 full-time equivalent students and it's a common trend among campuses um, like us uh, and industries sure. and uh, yet we still have more if you look at the staff and admin uh, the support talk about administrative bloat uh, the prior administration just kind of caved and, and um, gave the constituent groups uh what well, actually you'd say the, the fat trimming um have, what's your experience with that coming into an institution where you may have to do that well we we had I, I was telling the cabinet earlier we we had the institute of rent policy when i was at meridian and we were i mean we were at the 11th an hour from literally having the part of the choosing selection. Yes. yes. Um, and we were fortunate in that we did have a very healthy fund balance, and um, our board of trustees saw fit to dip into the fund balance for a year to stop that from occurring. So we didn't have to lay anybody off, and we were able to negotiate it through that. So what we did instead was there were positions that retired. We didn't we didn't fill those. Um, there were people who left, we didn't fill positions, so there was a lot of that that went on instead of actually letting people go. Um, at ACTC, that was done before I got there. Uh, as I said, there, there, was a, there was a huge layoff that had occurred. The previous president, prior to the one that I work for now, did that job of, of trimming the institution. And so, as a byproduct of that, we're now very lean. You know, we're about as lean as you can possibly get at ACTC. So, kind of see both sides of the, of the fence there. but. Um, it's a it's a reality that any president is going to have to face, and it's a tough decision. And I definitely wouldn't hire somebody that didn't make that decision. And it's I am going to read number ten. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was, Based on your research, you're other, cutting me off from my question. Yes, I am. Okay. You can save your question and you can ask it when we finish number ten. We talk so, Chair Wold, I just I just wanted to point out too that you also have the opportunity to have. Uh, dinner with Dr. Brand and his wife. So maybe some of this, uh, some of the questions about his opinion about how he might handle some different things could could potentially be discussed at dinner as well. I'm not cutting it you off. Is that true? Is what true? Do I have an opportunity to converse over dinner? I don't think you do. I don't think I do either, Angela. Just for the record, everyone. I'm not, I'm not invited to dinner. Okay, I did not get lunch before. I don't even get to eat lunch with this candidate at all. Would you please let me finish number 10. 
You can save your question until the end. I would like to know why I can't go to dinner tonight. And I want to know under whose authority I couldn't go to dinner tonight. Who made that decision? Because I can read you the motion that we made at the last open board meeting. Nowhere in the wording does it give anyone to make that decision. It was to set the date and the interviews. I made that decision. You did, and you're only the chair, and you have no more authority than other people. Thank you me. run the meeting. Thank you. I'm trying to run the meeting, but you're making it very difficult. No, I'm trying to understand why I'm not attending dinner. Chair Wolf, would it? you like would you like for me to ask question number 10, Chair Wolf? Would you please? Absolutely. So question number 10, Dr. Brand, based on your research of North Idaho College, please tell us your impressions of the college, including your most positive impressions and those you would like to address within the first 90 days. I think the overall impression of the college has been very positive. I think you've got a great campus. Um, I've looked over the academic programming, and I think you've got a good mix of programs that, that matches uh, what most comprehensive community colleges would have. Um, it's exactly what I'm looking for, and I, I alluded to that to, to both of the forums today, that it's the type of setup that I had in Mississippi. It's the way that our colleges are organized. It has all of those facets, vibrant student life, residential students on campus, athletics, the arts, um, and that's something that's not true everywhere. And so it, it's 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 what I'm looking for. Um, I you know I I do think that um, the first 90 days, and I've thought a lot about that question because I knew some version of that would probably come up 90 days or or 100 days, and it would match exactly what I did at ACTC the first 100 days I was there. I spent my first 100 days listening to other people. I've always been a fan, and it's going to sound cliche, and I apologize, this is going to sound elementary, but we've got two ears and one mouth, so I've always been of the opinion that I need to listen more than I need to speak, and so I would want to really find out from everyone's perspective at the institution, I would want to spend some time talking to everyone to see exactly where the institution is and where it needs to go, because I think if you don't include everyone, then you're only getting a partial picture. Um, so that would be the, the biggest thing to me, and that that's that goes from everybody, from the, the president's cabinet to the faculty, to the staff, everyone that works at the institution, I would want to spend that time with them. And then I believe you can begin to evaluate priorities and you can move from there. Um, and, and I think that some of these, some of the things that we talked about establishing um, a culture of uh, improving employee morale, of healing, uh, of accountability, I think those things can begin to take place. Thank you. I have a question about that. Before you do, I would like to make a comment. And that is, uh, Greg has intimated that we're not asking enough questions. The three of us are all good been. listeners. And we've been listening very intently to everything you've said. We've also done our homework before. So I will apologize if it seems like we have not asked as many questions as you would like to hear from us. John, you haven't had a chance to ask any questions, and you asked to wait till the end. Would you exactly. like to state anything? Lots of time. I've waited for other people. Mr. Chairman, I just uh, would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Brandt for taking the time for the interview, and I apologize for the, uh, the tone of this meeting. Pete, do you have anything you'd like to share? Um, no, I just want to say thank you. And just, uh, um, I think the, the last question you know, is, do you have any questions of us? Well, I know I've been asking more thoughts. You have one more question? Yes. Go right ahead. So when I got elected, there was, uh, there's, if you look at the policies, we actually met four out of the five uh reasons and qualifications to do a RIF. And if you look at the policy, we only need to meet one, and we're meeting four out of the five. Now, when I got elected, I did not want to come in here and fire everybody. I mean, it's, it's nobody's last deal, but here's the deal is um we're run out of COVID money and that kind of stuff. And I haven't seen the prior administration actually make tough choices and stuff like that. I imagine um the incoming president would. Um, would you how do you feel about that situation? 
Well, $15 million, which was what I read in the fund balance was projected for the current fiscal year. That's a, that's a quarter worth of operations money. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot. Uh, um, but at the same time, if something tragic or disastrous happened, it doesn't go very far. So I, I totally respect what you're saying. I, I'm not armed with enough information on the total number of faculty and staff, salaries, benefits, things that I would only be privy to if I were a president to really answer that question. If what you're asking is, if push comes to shove, and you know, am I a person who can make that tough decision, then that answer is yes. But I can't speak to any specifics because I just don't know. Thank you very much for coming and spending this time with us. I do apologize for the tenor of the meeting at times, but we appreciate your coming here. We appreciate what you shared with us. Yes, and we certainly, certainly do our best. Can Angela explain to the community the next steps for the interview? I believe the king is going to dinner and where? I'm not sure what your question is. You want Angela to do what? Angela was saying that we could, the board, members could ask questions. I was just offering off the board an opportunity to clarify for the community to know exactly the process that this is going on. The process is the two of us are going to join him and his wife for dinner tonight. And only you two. Only the two of us. And nobody else is invited. Correct. And under what authority was that made? As chairman. As chairman. And the president also agreed to that. And, and the legal counsel. So, yes. And um, Chair Wold, we might ask uh, legal counsel um, uh, about Open Meetings Act and the the dinner and how many trustees can be there if he's still in the room. Yes, he is. Would you like to address that? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> we would have a meeting, uh, an open meeting, uh, if we had a quorum of the board. So having individual trustees uh, meet that are, is, um, uh, that are less than a quorum would not constitute a meeting. So, so a serial meeting. No, it's not a serial meeting. This, this, would, this is, uh, trustees get the opportunity to, to individually engage with the candidates in, in different ways. That, that is a normal thing that happens. Just, just on a social thing, this is, um, as long as we do not have a quorum there, then it's not a meeting. Do you recall the last dinner for the last presidential search? What were the dinners done as? Greg, I'm, I'm not here to answer your questions. Okay, you 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 tried Are to you dominate. Are you refusing to answer my questions? No, please not. You you tried to dominate this meeting. I'm not here to answer your questions. So I explained why that would not be a meeting. And uh, that's where we are. And as for the community, I just want to point out the last dinners, all five trustees were in attendance. Thank you, Greg. I think that uh, we've finished. Now you see how the foundation operates. Welcome to the club. So, Dr. Brand, you have been a real champ. I know it's been a really long day for you. Um, and and um, thank you so much for making the trip to Idaho. I know it's a long trip out from Kentucky too. So uh, you and your wife, I'm sure, can enjoy the area just a little bit. And so thank you so much for meeting with the trustees and spending a day with, with the college. Thank you. I will be in touch, Dr. Brand. It'll probably be next week or so, but I will be in touch with you, okay, just to check in. Good deal. Thank, Thank you. you. The meeting is adjourned. I can get a motion. <laughs>